Corporation of India and National Payments Corporation of India. This fest is presented by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India and supported by Niti Ayo, Startup India and Invest India. The second edition of the summit with the theme FinTech, empowering a global digital economy, will provide an in-depth understanding of the latest business, policy, investment and technology developments within the FinTech landscape globally. All right, let's move forward with our keynote session on a very, very pertinent topic and that is new frontiers of emerging tech. So without further ado, may I please invite our session host, Mr. Naveen Surya, Chairman FinTech Convergence Council and Chairman Emeritus, Payments Council of India, and Mr. Christine Catalini, Co-Creator DM and Chief Economist DM Association. Welcome both of you and thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Mr. Surya. Thank you. Well, I think we're looking forward to an exciting presentation from you. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Let me try to upload my slides. Hopefully you can see them. Um, it's uh, it's really exciting to give you kind of an overview of how the, the landscape is evolving um, around the themes of, uh, of course, blockchain technology, but also stable coins and the relation uh, with uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, these are all topics that are uh, fairly timely and, and part of the question both in the US and abroad, and I hope you, you'll find some of this content interesting. Um, as an economist approaching this space uh, uh, over uh, eight years ago, uh, you know what, what stood out as, as very interesting is how this technology uh, surrounding blockchain and cryptocurrency can really be used uh, to change uh, how we design places, how we design digital platforms. Uh, you often hear about uh, this being a technology that can improve the cost of verifying digital information, but it's much more than that. Um, you know, if you roll the early days of the internet, uh, blockchain technology, as I'll, I'll discuss more in detail, can shape uh, a lot of these marketplaces and, and how competition really unfolds uh, between different different players, including new startups and, of course, uh, financial and, and, and tech incumbents. <clears throat> Well, what's interesting here is that, you know, from an economics perspective, you're really witnessing a reduction in the cost of networking and of creating really interoperable and programmable uh, protocols. Uh, here you have a picture of the early Internet, and I think we're very much in a similar phase um, around payments and financial services uh, built on top of blockchain technology. Interoperability is extremely important. And, and of course, you know, when you think about India, um, there's been tremendous progress in, in, in driving interoperability in payments and also in driving better identity standards, which can be an important uh, component of, 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 of course, interoperability and, and payments. Um, but more broadly, when you move uh, you know, outside of India, other regions, other countries have not made the same progress. And so uh, the potential here is in really using the building blocks of cryptocurrencies and blockchain to bring more interoperability competition and also more programming, so new types of financial services uh, to, to more parts uh, of the globe. <clears throat> what's interesting is that what started within uh, payments uh, is also starting to move into other sectors. So you may have heard about decentralized finance or, or DeFi um, or even NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So the same technology being used not only for building advanced financial services and advanced financial products in the, in the long run, uh, but also for monetizing digital content and engaging audience online in novel ways. Uh, so it's really fascinating to see how what started within uh, a narrow niche of is moving into a much more meaningful um, of the economy. Now, you often think that the technology is all about removing intermediaries, removing the role that intermediaries play uh, in these uh, financial transactions. The reality is more that you know blockchain is about uh, changing the nature of what intermediaries do in those transactions and, and really changing the balance of power between some of these key intermediaries and consumers, businesses, uh, and just building applications on on top of it. Uh, any new technology it also introduces uh, an interesting new set of challenges, and in particular, as we've seen already with cryptocurrency. How do we ensure that these new networks really reflect society's uh, broader values and principles? Um, so when you think about uh, issues such as fighting financial crime, um, fighting money laundering, 
uh, enforcing sanctions, um, and, and broadly ensuring that these new types of platforms when it comes to new financial services are built with integrity and with consumer protection and financial stability in mind. Um, really interesting between you know, what you can do with the technology and also ensuring that as you deploy it, uh, you're maintaining some of the protection and safety guards that we've come to expect from payments and the financial sector uh, more generally. Uh, now, what's interesting is that often people think of blockchain and cryptocurrencies just as soft, uh, but there's a really important interplay here between uh, institutions, including, of course, public sector institutions such as central banks and, and others, and the code that's deployed and uh, created by, by developers and, and startups. To some extent, for the technology to really reach its potential in terms of democratizing access to payments, financial services, and really expanding in many of these verticals that have stayed unchallenged for decades, uh, it will need to, um, to really be met with better regulatory frameworks and, and better institutional uh, frameworks that really allow for the good of the technology to be realized without, without some of the potential side effects. Uh, I think, you know, when, when economists like me this, what, what, what is really exciting is that if you look at the long term, uh, this is a technology that I think from a public sector perspective has a lot of potential really in increasing competition, uh, unleashing all wave of, of innovation in financial services, um, ultimately delivering really more uh, to consumers and businesses. And this is really done through enabling broader forms of ability. People often underestimate how important interoperability is, but when you think about um, uh, UPI, once systems are interoperable, you have to compete on a leveling playing field. So you have to entry, switching between different providers is lower cost. Uh, and more broadly, you start to force some, some unbundling of products and services that are bundled together for historical reasons. It's also a technology that has a lot of benefits uh, when you think about privacy. It can enable better forms of privacy while of course, compliance. Um, and in general, it can increase transparency and accountability uh, when services and products are, are really built on, on top of it. Uh, so that, that leads me to stable coins. Stable coins have been an important part of this ecosystem. Um, and they've seen kind of a massive explosion. Stable coins, essentially, they're uh, cryptocurrencies that are pegged uh, or to peg to uh, some other reference asset. Uh, most In most cases, that reference asset is the US dollar. And you have over $100 billion in stablecoin uh, pegged to the dollar that has been growing dramatically uh, since the, the first COVID lockdown. Now, started as a way to really arbitrage price differences and move in and out of fiat uh, when trading cryptocurrencies. Personally, I think actually the real potential of stablecoins when properly designed, and I'll get back to what properly designed really means, um, is going to relate to uh, actually providing better experience in payments and, and in financial um, services. Now, there are concerns around stablecoins. For example, here you have a quote from Governor Brainard. She compared some of these stablecoins to really the private monies that were issued by the white cat banks. The cat banking era was... Uh, an era in the United States, there were a number of bank defaults and 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 was rampant uh, between some of the systems. Uh, and I think some of these concerns are really are, are correct. Uh, if stablecoins are not properly regulated and they, they don't fit really in a proper framework, there is a uh, that consumers may not be uh, properly protected. And so uh, my hope is that over time, with better regulatory frameworks, the the these stable coins uh, coming into, into the market. Uh, to some extent, I think the word stable coin is of a misnomer. I mean, it implies that something is stable against the reference asset, but when you really look under the hood, there's a number of different designs that have been experimented with in the stable coin space. Um, and people often forget that the, the, the relationship between the asset that is backing a stablecoin and the reference asset, say the US dollar, uh, is a really important one. You have stablecoins that are trying to back uh, a dollar-based coin with assets that are completely uncorrelated uh, with the reference asset. Um, say they're backing it with uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and of course, if the value of those cryptocurrencies falls in value, then it's very likely for that stablecoin to become completely unstable and break, it, break its peg. Um, other forms of regulated uh, at different levels, stable coins 
uh, that are trying to back their uh, coins with fiat, uh, fiat-based fiat assets. Um, ideally, part of the design of DM, you're, you're only backing a stable coin with uh, what under you know Basel III, the Basel III framework, for example, would be considered high quality liquid assets uh, so that you can always raise coins back for fiat at par. So for the same value that was put in. Uh, that may require also additional uh, capital requirements to ensure that, for example, if you have a large run against the stable coin, you can sell those coins or essentially buy back those coins and sell the reserve assets and, and give every consumer or every business a dollar or a dollar. You can think of central bank digital kind of the top, the best, the gold standard uh, for a stable coin, of course, um, because in that case, you know, that, that asset is perfectly correlated with the underlying. <clears throat> uh, also, a lot of experiments with too, too much of the technicalities, a lot of experiments around stable coins. These are stable coins that try to build through software um, some dynamics to keep stable. The challenge with all of these stable coins is that actually they're really at risk of running into a dead spiral. Uh, so you may think you have an asset that is worth a dollar today, uh, but you know if expectations around the success of that ecosystem were ever to change, uh, the value of that asset would rapidly uh, precipitate to zero. So we discuss a lot of this more in the, um, uh, in, in in a paper uh, on the economic design of stablecoins uh, with Alonzo de Gortari. Uh, but fundamentally, the the key message here is that there's a lot of progress that needs to be made by most stablecoins available today to really meet. Uh, I think the standards that are needed to ensure consumer protection. Um, with DM, uh, we really took um, you know the idea of building a, a blockchain optimized for payments to heart, and so we made a number of decisions to really ensure that not only the design of the reserve is uh, the best that it can possibly be given the current re regulatory frameworks, uh, but also that things like compliance uh, and ensuring that the network uh, follows a safe perimeter where only good actors and, and regulated entities can participate is, is really enforced at the blockchain level. Um, we think this is extremely important uh, for expanding access to the financial system. Now, uh, of course, India has, has made a lot of progress on this dimension um, with all its, of its initiatives around identity and payments. Uh, but ironically, if you even look at the United States, uh, the United States is the trailing nation among the G7 in terms of basic access to the financial system. On average, 7% of the population is unbanked. And when you look at the, uh, about the bottom 40% of the income distribution, that's more like 15%. Uh, now, of course, other countries are doing much better, uh, but we do think that stable coins can be a better on-ramp uh, to the financial system. There can be a cheaper way for people to perform payments uh, and get basic services uh, at a lower cost. So when it comes to, to DM and, and the economic design of, of the DM stablecoin, the first one would be the DM dollar. Uh, there, there's a number of things that we're trying to do. First of all, build trust in that coin and, and in the payment network. Second, ensuring that very much like with UPI, uh, you can get competition on top of this network so that large player and small players are really facing the same the same constraints and can compete on a level playing field so that a startup, for example, coming on a network can be interoperable with a larger player or a merchant can switch between different payment service providers and different ways of accepting payments without repercussions. Um, and, and last, we also want to build the proper governance and, 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 and framework to ensure that the network can evolve and prosper over the long run. Uh, I've already discussed, you know, we, we put a number of protections in the design of the reserve, uh, starting from uh, ensuring that it's backed only with cash and cash equivalents, or you know, think about three months or less US treasuries, um, and, and also ensuring transparency and auditability around that so that people can always verify that these coins are properly backed. We will also not allow for additional fractionalization to emerge on top of DM. Uh, so one of the concerns about existing stable coins is that they enable different forms of shadow banking. And we think that that is actually a threat uh, to the stability of those coins and the stability of those ecosystems. Now, what's interesting is that because of, um, I think, our, our presentations and discussions are about our future reserve, uh, there seems to be a, a race for improving stable coin transparency 
and the composition of the reserve. I think there's still a lot to do there for, for most major stable coins to meet really the bar of something that can be trusted over the long run. But it, it's nice to see that this space is really evolving and there's pressure also from regulators to improve the design of these stable coins. Um, at a high level, we think, again, another really important competi- uh, element here is competition. And how do we ensure that this works like an open technology standard? So very much like uh, UPI, so that every player is interoperable with each other and, and that we can really ensure a good degree of competition. That's something that we're working on. And we're also working on, on some key commitments that DM can make to support uh, smaller players and to support the growth uh, of the network in, 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 a, in, in a way that fosters competition. Um, one important commitment of our project, and this is, uh, you know, probably something that makes us somewhat unique here, is we're the only stablecoin project that has publicly committed to phasing out our token, say our DM dollar, if a digital dollar from the Fed becomes available. Uh, we really believe in a collaboration between the public and the private sector. Uh, and so we think it's extremely important that when these better assets issued by the public sector become available, we put them on our network and we replace uh, the privately issued uh, DM dollar. Uh, so you may ask, you know, there's a lot of stable coins out there. Some have market cap of tens of billions of dollars. Why build a new stable coin? Well, first of all, because none of these stable coins has really made a dent yet in, in consumer and retail and merchant payments. That's an area that we're, we're focused on, including cross-border payments and remittances. We, can, we, we think that through our partners, we can drop the cost of remittances substantially way below Uh, the sustainable development uh, goal of of 3%. So this is a network that will allow you to move value almost for free across the globe and convert it back into local currency, uh, hopefully at very competitive rates. Um, The other dimension is really bringing better standards to this space. While we see a lot of potential in blockchain technology, there are not very high standards for consumer protection, reserve design, and really ensuring that any one of these stablecoins does not interfere with um, macroeconomic policy in the regions where they become available. Think about issues such as dollarization. Uh, It's really important to have a framework uh, to to address those those concerns. The second key dimension is is bringing better uh, financial crime and compliance standards. Um, Today, the space, again, because it's nascent, does not have the same financial crime and compliance standards that you expect from regular payment. And we think that's gonna be increasingly a concern as these coins can be otherwise used for financial crime um, and all sort of other nefarious use cases. Um, We also believe more broadly in developing a public-private partnership. So working really with the central banks and the public sector in building the payment infrastructure and the financial infrastructure of the future. Um, This really builds on many of the ideas that central banks have, have released over the last few years. Here you're seeing, for example, an important discussion paper the Bank of England wrote, where they do talk about a strong complementarity between what the public sector does in this space and what the private sector can do on on top of it. Um, there, often you hear this debate of is it stable coins or is it central bank digital currencies? Um, now here you have another governor uh, from the Federal Reserve Board saying that look, if we can properly structure stable coins and regulate them in the right way, and we address all concerns that the current stable coins have, then maybe we don't need CBDCs. And so you could even imagine a future very much building on the public-private partnership that we have around money today between commercial banks and the central bank. Um, this could be an extension of that. And some of these stable coins likely could be regulated uh, like banks or with bank-like regulation, especially when they pose some of the, the same risks. Um, there's a there's a piece that we wrote with uh, Zai Masari uh, in the Harvard Business Review, uh, really about stablecoins and the future of money. And in the in the in in the piece, we try to surface you know three options that we think the public sector can explore. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive options, and so you could even imagine different countries trying different um, different approaches at the same time and in parallel. Uh, and seeing kind of what 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 works, what doesn't work, where is there a market failure, where do we need public sector intervention? Um, these three paths build on the idea that today, if you look at developed economies, ninety five percent of money uh, is private, uh, and and that creation of money is really uh, performed through um, banks um, and other depository institutions. Of course, with with public sector guarantees such as FDIC insurance in the United States. 
Uh, but when you look at stable coins, really the idea of separating some of the function of monetary and credit functions, uh, there's been discussions, at least in the United States, tracing back 80 years on this issue. Um, and so in the piece, we discussed three, three, three ways uh, for upgrading our system of money. The first one is kind of true stable coins, uh, which I'll discuss in a second. The second one really ties this to the banking system and think about what we call deposit stable coins. Uh, and then also the, the, the kind of the CBDC path, where you could see the public sector issuing a CBDC token and then those tokens being available and used on many different types of private and public sector uh, networks. So uh, br briefly in the interest of time, true stable coins are things like DM. Uh, so these are meant to be uh, payment tools and they should hold, you know, 100 percent one to one reserves in high quality liquid assets. So for the DM dollar, think about three months or less U.S. treasuries and maybe cash at the Fed. Um, of course, you need additional capital requirements uh, to absorb losses potentially. Um, and um, what's nice about these new new entities could be that, you know, they look a little bit like narrow banks. Um, but they're really trying to support an efficient uh, payment network. Uh, there's a number of concerns that will need to be addressed and really ensuring that, you know, for example, if one of these stable coins runs into insolvency or bankruptcy, the holders of the coins are the first ones that are able to, to get their money out. Uh, but we do think that this could be an important innovation in, in, the, in the payment and financial services landscape. <clears throat> Probably less uh, less innovative to some extent, but you could imagine attaching the existing banking rails uh, to what we call deposit stable coins. Uh, these could fall very much under the current banking framework. And so in the United States, for example, you could have banking capital requirements and FDIC insurance uh, on some of these coin deposits. Uh, of course, the question becomes, can this really change competition? Can this really change the number of players that can bring services uh, to this space? Uh, but it is an interesting option for countries that, that really want to build this on top of the existing banking rails. And last, of course, you know, as the public sector gets ready to, to build central bank digital currencies, we at DM we pretty much assume that CBDCs will be a reality a few years from now, even if different countries will get there at different speeds. Uh, you could imagine really a complementarity between these CBDC tokens issued by the central bank and private sector payment networks such as such as DM and, and of course the legacy networks. Um, now, when it comes to the public sector, this is such a difficult challenge because a CBDC network will need to meet really high, a very high bar for security and resilience. And so we think there's a nice complementarity between what the private sector can do and what the public sector can do. So on the public sector side, I think it's really important right now to set really high standards for consumer protection and financial stability, uh, and also ensuring that these new networks and cryptocurrencies and stablecoins do not present a threat uh, from, a from a financial crime perspective. Um, and, and of course, where the private sector can add value to private public sector efforts is really in developing those consumer and business-facing products and, and experiences that will make it easier for people to pay uh, our business, for people to send money abroad, uh, for people to, to accept payments in, in, in general. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think what, what's really interesting here is that, you know, you often hear as BDCs and stablecoins competing with each other. I really want to stress that I think these two technologies and these two efforts are complements and they can really enhance each other very much like, you know, in the early days of the internet, you had years and decades of private uh, public sector uh, research and, and development. And then you had an explosion of innovation and entrepreneurship um, through uh, the commercial internet. Uh, so we, we, we think that that's really what we're trying to build here in this space. And so we're actively engaged with a number of regulators across the globe and trying to understand not only their concerns with regards to stable coins and how we can address them, but also how can we really foster broader financial inclusion um, and better services at a lower cost uh, for a number of constituents. Uh, so I thank you for your attention. I very much look forward uh, to discussing uh, this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. I think that was very insightful. In fact, some of the questions I was planning to ask was already answered. So let me start with the first one, the basic one. When are we seeing the DIM going live finally? I mean, everyone's waiting. It's interesting innovation that you guys have work, been working. So when can we expect it to go live? 
Yeah, as you as as you can imagine, we've been engaged with regulators across many jurisdictions um, across the globe now over more than two years, um, and we think that process has made uh, not only our design more robust, but it has also allowed allowed us to go from you know a first white paper which had a number of gaps and was extremely naive on a number of areas uh, to a much more robust and well designed concept. Um, we're still engaged in that dialogue. And, um, you know, I, I've now come to learn that the timeline is very much in the ends of the regulators more than more than DM. Um, we, we think we have a pretty robust design and, and we're really excited to bring it to market uh, as soon as we. OK, so it's, it's still there's no specific data. I understand it. I'm sure there are concerns. So. I think you already clarified that it's more like a true stable coin, the DM that you're planning the design. At the same time, you said that uh, the plan of DM is actually when the CBDC of dollar or dollar CBDC is rolled out, you would actually withdraw it from the market. So why do it at all? I mean, you, we all know that eventually most comments will have a CBDC. So why have a construct which is going to just serve an interim purpose? Maybe three to five years. Uh, I mean, the way the number of uh, banks, central banks are already working, on CBDC, I believe three to five years, most of them will have something. Yeah, that, that is an excellent yeah. question. And to be honest, the sooner CBDCs come, uh, the better for DM. So we would be very happy to you know, have our coin live even for a few months and then have to replace it with a CBDC. Um, it streamlines what we have to do. It reduces the scope of, of our work. Uh, and it can actually really provide a really good experience for consumers and businesses when we can start moving CBDC tokens. Now, the challenge is that, as you know, although some central banks in, in, in China is probably the country that's the most ahead on this, have already um, you know, explored different concepts and pilots, we don't see that happening um, within the next few months or even the next couple of years. Um, and in that time, I think there's a lot of value in creating a token that really meets um, what you think are kind of the highest standards that you come to expect from financial services institutions um, and can start delivering value for consumers and businesses. So uh, you're right. It is it is an interim uh, phase. It's one that we think it's still going to last, um, uh, you know, many months, if not years in many regions. And so um, we're starting with that. We, we're very public about the fact that we're looking for these and we're committed to transferring over uh, when that becomes available. Uh, but we also don't want to miss the opportunity of really expanding on access to payments in the financial sector uh, for, for more years uh, until CBD. What do you think that the CBDC may be less critical for US government? Because even for most cryptos and stable coin, it's a dollar, which is anyway is the, is the tether or is the, is the denominator. But for the other government, it may be more relevant. So will there be a different strategy for U.S. market and other markets for you to keep DM live and not live? No. So, again, in any region where the DM network is, is, is going to be available, if there is a CBDC, we're really committed in integrating with the public sector rails. Uh, we think that will bring a lot more functionality too, as people will be able, you know, to go from a different network to DM and back. Uh, so, you know, interoperability works not just on the network, but also with uh, public sector infrastructure. Um, of course, you know, if there was, uh, say, a digital rupee or, you know, in the future, maybe a digital euro uh, or a digital pound, um, we would make it a priority to to allow for that integration uh, because that suddenly makes the, the DM network useful to a number of businesses uh, and consumers in, in those regions. Um, so um, again, we're excited about these developments. We're happy to engage. Um, also now you could you know, work with the public sector, for example, for moving their CBDC on DM rails, uh, as well as other rails. Uh, we think we have, we think actually that uh, some central banks may look at it and say, well, this is actually a good way to deploy our CBDC, uh, maybe together with public sector rails on the side too. Interesting. So uh, do you want to talk about some of the use cases uh, in the retail or a wholesale, or it's largely focused on the retail use cases, just to kind of give a perspective where it can really make yeah. a big difference? Yeah, we think, look, the, the first area where we can make a massive difference is uh, cross-border remittances. Uh, World Bank estimates, right? So the average cost of sending money abroad is 7%. That is also combined often with long delays. 
even people that use, these are called kind of the smart remittance senders that send money through a digital app or you know uh, a mobile phone. Um, even those people pay on average 4.2%. Uh, so I think we can make those remittance flows instantaneous and almost free. Uh, so that maybe a consumer can get a wholesale rate on an exchange rate, say between the dollar and the rupee, uh, rather than than the traditional consumer rate. Um, so that's that's the first area, and we think that's going to be a very important use case, uh, especially now with COVID, where these remittance flows can be very important in a number of regions. Um, second, uh, even when you look at U.S. domestic markets, where, you know where we we probably plan to start with the DM dollar, of course. Um, merchants, small businesses and medium businesses today. Now, of course, in India, things have, have made a lot more progress, but but in the US, it's very expensive for a small business uh, to, to accept payments, especially digital payments. Uh, there's no such thing as, as UPI. Uh, and, and so payment service providers and the traditional card networks can charge very high fees. You have a composition of interchange and all these historical fees. Uh, we think that DM can really... Um, uh, provide a better low-cost alternative for all those merchants and businesses. And we're really excited to to work um, over over the next years also with a number of key payment service providers uh, because we do think that the network can really give them a better backbone for what they're trying to do. Uh, so starting with cross-border and remittances, moving into P2M, so payments to merchants, and really trying to bring a lot of the benefits that I think India has already seen uh, through its upgraded payment infrastructure and greater competition in payments. Um, to Do you think, uh, so just two quick last questions, I think we just have a couple of minutes. So one is that I'm sure you've noticed the announcement from Reserve Bank of India about connecting UPI as a fast payment, Singapore fast pay as a remittance corridor. Do you think if the fast payment rail directly gets integrated across the globe, then again, there is implication on use cases, then there's less relevance? So I think, I think again, those efforts, I know people love to paint them as competing. We, we think those are fantastic developments. Uh, whenever, you know, two different regions have a better interoperable backbone for moving value between them and that's public, uh, that that we think is, is something really positive that will not only increase the flows, but also make it easier again and cheaper uh, for people uh, to move value. Uh, we still think that you know the network over time, also because of programmability and, and the things you can build on top of it, could provide additional value on top of services like that. And so you could imagine a future where uh, maybe that corridor uh, as CBDCs on both ends, and maybe those tokens can also be exchanged through DM, and DM can bring some functionality that you don't have on on, on the upgraded payment systems. Uh, so you know RTGS and upgrades to RTGS, I think, are, are really important. But at the same time, here there's the opportunity to build a lot more uh, by using blockchain, by using programmability, and by bringing you know eventually an array of developers. I mean, India, for example, has, has a very vibrant entrepreneurial ecosystem. And you, you can just imagine what, what can those people build once they're given uh, the right toolbox. And, and so think of DM as a toolbox for, for those. Interesting. So one last one, very quick one. Do you think the DM rollout will again be depending on which other countries where the currency is fully, fully convertible, so easy to kind of move in and out, and the countries where uh, convertibility is still a challenge? So... Well, what's interesting is that we, we, we're we taking a very regulatory friendly approach. And, and so, for example, today, stable coins are used uh, for escaping to our currency or for evading capital controls. Uh, we think that is not a very constructive way to build a network because countries will have concerns about their own monetary policy. And if people can evade all those controls by using these stable coins, eventually these stable coins will be blocked. Uh, we want to build a partnership with, with, with these governments. And so one of the important aspects of our network is that only regulated entities, regulated VASP, so virtual asset service providers like wallet exchanges, will be able to operate. So insofar as a region, for example, has some restrictions, those will apply to DM the same way they, tr they apply to the traditional system. We think that's a much more constructive build of this. And so you can even imagine countries that are particularly worried about uh, capital outflows or capital flight may allow remittances coming in in DM uh, dollars and then having them converted into, into local currency. So you can have an array of designs that will address those concerns. Thank you very much. I think I can keep going on, but uh, I think we just kind of forced a couple of minutes. So I would stop here. Uh, uh, nice talking to you. I think uh, looking forward to announcement of 
in life. So thank you very much. Chris. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Have thank a great day. Thank you so much, Mr. Naveen, and thank you so much, Christine. It was absolutely wonderful to have you. I hope you had a good uh, discussion and a good session. We definitely did. So thank you very much for joining us and supporting us, and take care. So all right, we come to an end of the session, and uh, there are more parallel sessions that's happening, so please don't miss those.